Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's Thrive in China Roundtable. The topic for this week is 10 reasons why some businesses are not successful in the Chinese market. What I'm finding in China um, is that there are a lot of companies who are keen to take advantage of the opportunities that exist there. They spend a lot of manpower and thought process on the initial steps of getting into China. What's the best business model? What's the best methodology? And they even spend money on doing this type of research. But then once it actually comes down to the implementation, to the continuous support that is needed for an entity in China, um, and then finally getting into that growth and scale phase, there's a decline. And I guess what I want to say is that I'm not here today to say that when companies are not successful in China, they just exit the market. All right. That's that's actually not what I'm saying. Why companies are not successful in the Chinese market for me is a definition of why they are not scaling and growing at the rate that they are or that everybody is expecting them to grow and scale at. All right. And in the end of the day, a lot of the problems and issues arise with one sole problem, which is communication, which generally stems from senior management as well as personnel in the HQ. So I wanna talk about what traits the HQ has, and what traits leaders have, senior managers, um, and this can be foreign individuals, it can also be Chinese individuals, it can be American Chinese individuals, it can be a whole variety of people that just lack the initiative or the understanding of how to adapt themselves when doing business in the Chinese market. Now, for a lot of these 10 reasons that I have created today, um, a lot of them are mistakes that I made. Um, so a lot of it is going to be case studies of what I have actually done wrong. Some of them are actually uh, friends of mine, what I have seen as an observer and as a friend, what they have done wrong. And there's one or two that are actual client case studies. But what I want to highlight from today is that it is actual leadership traits, not necessarily the issues around the geopolitical climate, the economy, client issues. This happens on a day-to-day -day basis, no matter in which jurisdiction you are in, okay? But we are looking at today what causes companies to become stagnant in China because senior managers, leaders, or HQ just don't get their act together and don't focus on what needs to happen in the Chinese market. So this is an overview of the 10, re uh, 10 reasons that we're going to be looking at. Um, uh, and I'll go into detail with case studies about each of these. All right, so the first reason is the refusal to adapt. Now, if you've launched your business in China on the strength of one brilliant idea on one market research study that has really shown you the opportunities that exist in China and the launch is successful, there is a tendency to feel reluctant to make any changes to the original concept that has been generated in your business strategy, in your budget. Basically, you are unwilling to pivot what is written inside your Chinese strategy or in your Chinese budget. This is extremely common because there is zero flexibility that your head office is providing to you in order to be able to adapt to the climate and the situation that is occurring in China. And this is where actually the geopolitical climate, the economy, the pandemic comes into play. Businesses have had to pivot themselves budget-wise, strategy-wise, in order to be able to survive. Simple as that. But there is always this fear, if you will, this restriction, sometimes from HQ, but also from senior managers on the ground because they're scared to rock the boat. But in situations like this, we have to rock the boat. We have to make sure that we pivot our organization 
so that we can continue to scale and grow in the market. If you refuse to adapt, this is what's going to lead you to high turnover of staff because the staff in China are going to get fed up that you're not flexible enough to adapt. They're gonna get fed up that you're not growing um, at all and you wanna remain on the status quo. So there's a, an issue around turnover. If you don't, I don't, I wanna, I wanna use the word invention, but if you don't create new product lines, new service lines, or adapt your products to the Chinese market, as soon as you find out what the consumer trends are or what the business trends are, you're gonna die. You're gonna become stagnant, all right? So you have to have the mindset of being able to adapt. And I, I'm gonna give you guys, I'm in the world of corporate compliance. So I'm gonna give you a mistake that I made. When I went into China in 2003, and the refusal to adapt is not just on products, services, on ways of doing business. It's also on just realizing that from a legal and tax compliance perspective, China is very different. You cannot keep the same accounting standards. You can't keep the same methodology of how you do your expenses or how you operate your supply chain. You're going to have to adapt everything. One thing that happened to me is... Um, back in 2003, the HQ, that's my brother and my father, we had the philosophy of taking the employment contract templates in Hong Kong, thinking it's usable in China, never really getting it checked um, by Chinese labor lawyers. And when we wanted to terminate our first employee, which was within the first 10 months of launching the business, um, burn and crash is all I can say. Um, and that was the refusal to get help, the refusal to adapt, to make the assumption that what you're doing in HQ, even if your HQ is Hong Kong, is the same and can be emulated in China. Not possible. Now, I love this photo because it says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is false in China. Improvement is always possible. And I have um, a webinar series that I do around mindset and doing business in China. And I'm a big believer in the Japanese philosophy of Kaizen, which is continuous improvement. As a senior leader, as a manager of your China operations, your mindset should be every day, how can I improve this business 1% by 1%? How can I make it better? How can I improve internal operational guidelines? How can I get more clients? How can I improve our products, our packaging? How can I improve the supply chain to make everything more efficient, potentially reduce cost, and ultimately make the business grow and scale? All right, it's important, so important to have that mindset. Reason number two is too much or too little involvement in the detail. Now, originally when I used to do this presentation five, 10 years ago, I used to say little involvement. I've added now too much into uh, the spiel. Why? Because most of the time, leaders and the HQ get so involved in the excitement of launching the business in China that they look at every single finite detail and they're so focused on these details that it prevents them from actually garnering business because their contracts are not flexible enough or they're not willing to be more flexible when negotiating. They're so strict, rigid, and stringent at the beginning on what is happening. And they go into really all of the detail imaginable that once things start kicking off slightly, they kind of take a breather and stand back. And actually today I had a perfect example of this with a client of mine. We're setting up their entity in China right now. And the gentleman from the HQ said, I can't wait till people are on the ground. They're arriving next week or at least in the next two weeks uh, into Shanghai um, because then I can take a step back. Now, he has not been too much into the details. He's just focused on making sure that there is continuous progress with the company setup and that there are no delays, etc. But I started getting anxious for the company when I heard the term, I'm going to step back a, a little bit as soon as people are on the ground. Why would you step back? Just because people are on the ground does not mean now you can step back and relax. It means that you've got to pivot yourself, become more flexible, 
and still understand what is going on in general around the business. What I want to say by this is when you spend too much time into the details, you become strict. There's a lack of flexibility and you're, there's this unwilling, one unwillingness to pivot and sometimes maneuver yourselves away from the strategy. Too little involvement in the business means that the people on the ground think you don't care anymore. And if you're not having, if you don't give them the flexibility to make decisions, they're going to be hanging around waiting for decisions to be made by you in the HQ or by other people in the HQ, which is just going to delay the processes and you'll never be able to scale or grow your business. So the question is, are you going to spend more time on the business? Are you going to spend more time in the business? Or are you going to spend more time on um, giving power of authority to certain individuals that are on the ground that will spend time on and in the business and you have an overview of what is happening? There is no right or wrong in this, but just decide what you're going to do and do it with the perspective of being flexible, willing to pivot, always amending your strategy, always thinking about what the vision of the company is and that you're trying to reach that vision. Making sure also that the people that you hire and that are in your ecosystem know what that vision is and have the same ambition and goal and objective to reach the KPIs that you need to achieve. So whether that means spending too much time or too little time, actually nobody really cares as long as everybody is reaching the goals. But make sure that if you do spend a lot of time in the business or on the business, it makes sense. All right. The same if it's in the business or the same if you've got an overview, make sure it makes sense for the ultimate business. And if you need to spend more time, then do it. If it means you have to travel and do the quarantine, do it. This leads me on to the third reason, which is insufficient care when hiring. Now, it's a fact, a business is only as good as its people. Um, and I even extend that to the point of, you need to have an ecosystem of individuals um, in China. And by individuals, this can also mean people that are working within companies that are third parties, but you need to have an ecosystem of individuals that are striving for the goals and objectives that you wanna reach. And a question you should be constantly asking yourself is, do your employees have the talent, the creativity, the inclination, the oomph to take your business forward? Because if they don't, then actually they're not the right fit for your organization. And the minute that you feel that they are not the right fit for your organization, you should be terminating them. And that ultimately, ultimately means you should be rocking the boat. My, one of the, my biggest mistakes um, as an accounting firm was the fact that I hired people and I, you know, in the hiring stage, you're never sure, but I didn't take enough time in the probation period to really check whether they were a good fit, whether they were accomplishing what I needed them to accomplish checking whether what we hired them for, which is normally to delegate work to, was actually being done um, until it was too late. And then it comes to a point where because you're in your startup phase, you don't actually want to rock the boat. You're a little bit worried about change of staff, high turnover. What are your clients going to think? What is HQ going to think that you can't manage your business? So make sure that in the recruitment phase, in the probation period, you are really checking that the people that you are hiring are the right fit, that they can carry the business forward as you are expanding in China, okay? You don't wanna just find people that are for right now, you wanna find people that are going to stay with you, are gonna be loyal with you, that are excited about the growth of the business. So make sure that there's enough care and attention to this when you are in the hiring recruitment phase of these individuals. Number four is my favorite topic, which is number blindness. Now, a good CFO, whether it's somebody you hire in-house or whether it's somebody you outsource, 
is fundamental for your China business. I don't think any decision can actually be made concerning growth and scaling without a financial person sitting next to you, guiding you with those decisions, all right? Now, all of you will say, yeah, this, this makes total sense. Of course we need this, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but nobody does it, all right? They're so concerned by cost and they put the lowest amount of their budget into using a local accounting provider that generally doesn't speak English or doesn't provide the advisory work that you need in order to make decisions in your startup phase, but also in your growth phase so that you don't become stagnant, right? I've done, a, I've done a recording just on this topic about the vital importance of having a Chinese accountant support your business. Can you watch the word I'm using? Support, not help you to remain in compliance, right? That's, that's a duh. Of course they have to make sure that your company stays in compliance, but they should be there to support the startup phase of your business and ultimately help you to make the decisions for growth and scale. Now you might say, oh, a CFO, I don't need a CFO from day one. Look, you can also have your CFO and your HQ support the China business, but then they also have to understand what their limitations are. Can they truly support the business, right? How are you going to do your finances? How are you going to do your accounting? Are you going to have two sets of books? Is one set going to be according to PRC gap and according to the compliance work? So it's just day-to-day -day compliance. Or will you have a second set of books that actually is based on accrual accounting and gives you a true reflection of your business? Because the Chinese gap does not do that, right? So it's also important to understand and have a knowledge base on what Chinese gap can offer you versus actually doing it the traditional Western accrual methodology. But having somebody to advise support, this is why actually um, to differentiate ourselves from other providers in China, it is mandatory when a client sets up, uh, signs up with Woodburn, we have a monthly call. We call it the CFO meeting. We have a monthly call with our clients to talk about the financial management reports, to understand how we and have a Kaizen mindset. How can we improve and continuously improve? And also we use that call to make decisions. Can we afford to hire more staff? Or questions pop up, we wanna hire somebody who's not in the location of the company. Can we do that? Or uh, can we invest in equipment? Do we have the capital to invest? If we don't, what are our options? These are all discussions that have to happen with your CFO. And they have to understand what is possible and not impossible, uh, what is possible and not possible in China before you actually execute that action. Don't execute an action and wing it. And that's when obstacles and issues arise. And actually you spend more, more money getting out of those situations than if you would have just asked your CFO what you can and cannot do. All right, so again, you have an option. Hire yourself a good CFO or alternatively outsource it to a provider that provides that additional advisory that you do need, particularly in your startup phase, looking at cash flow, looking at various aspects of the business. And this initiative comes down. I mean, my CFO is my right, right how do you call it? She's a woman, my right wing woman. I, I don't do anything without consulting her, right? Your managers, your leaders in China should be consulting with their CFOs, their China CFOs, and potentially their HQ CFOs, depending on how big the investment is. So again, something that is ultimately critical. Reason number five is market assumptions. Now, it pays to know your market. We all know that. Um, and in today's climate, this is extremely critical. Market research is generally done uh, prior to launching what you're looking to do in China. And that market research generally is focused on what are the opportunities in China and what's the ultimate return on investment. But after that, 
generally companies don't have a budget to do continuous research. So when you're looking at market assumptions, make sure that you're continuously understanding your market in China, understanding that the market itself is pivoting, it's changing, and at a faster pace than any other Western country. And it was very clear to see that, how China in 2020 became such a digitalized nation with the pandemic and COVID. And that's what it is today. And you have to adapt to that. So you can do your market, you should be doing your market research before you're launching your business in China on whatever business model suits you. But it's also important to make sure you are continuously doing that so that you can continuously pivot your own business, make decisions based on data that you're obtaining on what is happening in the market. Data is fundamental. Um, so that again, you can grow and you can scale. If you don't do that, then ultimately you are going to remain stagnant because you're not adapting yourself to the climate. And in China, it is a changing climate constantly changing. In addition to all of this, you should also be focusing on your business models. So when you get data from the market, you need to analyze whether the business model you have created still makes sense based on the market analysis that has come in. If it does not make sense, that is the trigger for you to decide how to adapt and how to change the business model to again, continue to grow and scale in the market. All right, number six is control freak leadership, which was my fault also as I started up in China. Um, and I say that because I was actually on the ground in China in 2003, and I felt that I did everything better than my team. I never delegated work, and eventually it just became so overwhelming for me that we became stagnant. Um, because I just could not do everything myself. That also in turn made me realize that I had not done sufficient care in hiring. I didn't have the right team to delegate work to, which meant that I did have a period of staff turnover because I, I realized I just could not as a leader move on. And I hired new individuals come in, to come into our own structure where I then empowered them step-by-step, step, not from day one, but I empowered them and encouraged them to take action and decisions themselves. And how did I do that? I did it by actually creating operational guidelines that were very flexible pieces of documents. Um, because again, my mindset had completely changed after that five-year initial step in China to say, if. Operational guidelines are there just as a guideline, but we always have to be able to pivot. And anytime we pivot, there has to be a meeting to discuss how we're pivoting and how we can then amend the operational guidelines. One thing that I learned, and it took me five years to learn this, is that as a foreigner in China, I will never ever know the market like my team knows it. Never. They will always be one step ahead of me in market knowledge. In my business, being in the accounting and corporate compliance sector, they will always know more about accounting regulations, tax regulations, compliance regulations than I will. I actually am learning from them. I have to admit that. I may know a lot, but a lot I have learned through them. And it took me a long time to relinquish that power and that control freak leadership. Now I have staff members coming in meetings because in the end of the day, when they're talking to the clients, they know more than I know, right? They have to be there. When you are building your team, lower your expectations on yourself as a foreigner. You will never know more than your local team. You should actually never be knowing more than them. If you do know more than them, it means you don't have the right team members on staff. And when you do have that right fit, you should be empowering those staff members 
to take control over their job responsibilities, encourage them to take action, to be brash, and to go out there with the vision that you have of growing and scaling the business. Now, of course, there should be supervision over your team, but don't be a control freak leader looking over their shoulder every second of the day. Let them have this freedom to go out there and prove themselves to you, all right? It is very hard to do when you go into China, you've got stress from your HQ to hit results. You feel like you gotta take control over, over everything. It's very hard to relinquish that control to staff members you've just hired, you barely know. It's tough. I admit it, it's really, really tough, which is why you've got probation periods. Use that as the testing phase to see if these are the right staff members who can take action, take initiative on their own in order to be able to grow the business. But all I can say is when you do relinquish the reins, my God, is there a weight off of your shoulders as a leader where you can then focus on more critical issues than looking over every staff member to see if they're typing an email correctly, which is what I did in the past, all right? And also, if you feel like staff members are not maybe writing emails, for example, in the way that you would like them to, pay for training, right? Provide your team members with training. You might not have put that in a budget, but it's something that I highly recommend you to think about is offering training to staff members to see if they can improve themselves. Reason number seven is marketing bias. Does your company look like something you would expect to find in a big business world? Or does it look inescapably small? Branding and marketing are fundamental in China. Do not have the expectation that the entire Chinese market is aware of your foreign brand. And when you are creating your budget, make sure there is a significant chunk of spending available for brand recognition, brand building, brand adaptation. Okay, don't forget that you may have to adapt your brand to fit the Chinese culture and the Chinese market. You want to be considered a big hitter in China. You want millions of consumers to go on your Tmall platform, flagship store, or go into your retail store, or you want wholesalers to be reaching out to you left, right, and center to say, we want to represent your company. We want to represent your brand. How are they going to approach you if they know nothing about you? And I always get the question, well, Christina, what is this magic number that we need to spend on marketing? There is no magic number. It really comes down to what your financial resources are in China for the Chinese market. Okay? Take a look at that budget and understand how much you're willing to spend for marketing, brand promotion, brand recognition, brand awareness, et cetera. Okay? Um, and see what you're going to get out of that. Talk to marketeers, talk to PR agencies, understand what they can offer you in order to build up your brand in the Chinese market. But even before you do that, understand what your goal and objective is. Is your goal to be recognized by consumers? Is your goal to be recognized by distributors? Who is your target market in the end of the day? Once you have an understanding of that, then you have a better understanding of how to approach the marketing agencies, media agencies, PR agencies, okay? But definitely think about marketing and understand what will work. Do not make the mistake where you, you don't adapt your marketing campaigns to China either. Um, there are still a lot of companies that emulate their marketing campaigns in other Western countries to China. It just simply won't work. Reason number eight is cultural diversity. And this is where I see a lot of clients making mistakes. 
Um, was it a shock for me to go into China um, as a senior manager, senior leader? Yes, I'm born and raised in Hong Kong. It was still a shock to go to China. There were still cultural aspects which surprised me, um, shocked me. Uh, initially, I wasn't open to, but I grew up in Hong Kong and I was just raised with the mentality of, well, mentality at home was, if you don't try, you don't know, don't make a judgment if you don't try. You can't say you don't like something if you don't try it first. When you as a leader or as an entrepreneur are going, are, are launching your business in China, do not underestimate you as a senior leader or as a business owner and what you can bring to the growth and scale of the business in China. Don't just delegate everything at some point, you also have to be present, show yourself in order to be able to win deals, to bring loyalty to the staff members. They want to see you because you are the visionary, which also means, and obviously once border controls are eliminated and there's less quarantine regulations and there's more free tra travel, make sure the entrepreneurs, the senior leaders, the owners of the businesses are making the effort to travel over to China to visit the staff after this whole pandemic, to visit clients, to um, showcase yourself as the head of the company. And when you're doing that, make sure that you adapt yourself to the culture. If that means eating Chicken feet, it means trying chicken feet. If it means doing karaoke, it means doing karaoke. Um, adapt yourself to the pleasures of what your team and your clients want to see you do. And sometimes it's extremely embarrassing, but at some point you also have to do it. So don't underestimate the need for you in China. Make sure you prioritize that again, as a leader, as a senior manager, as a business owner, but also when you go to China, adapt yourself to the market. My suggestion also would be to do a round of speaking events, get yourself known, use that as a marketing strategy and a PR campaign to really build up your brand awareness as well. Okay. Reason number nine is lack of vision. Um, next week, I am actually doing a workshop series on incorporating entities in China. It's really geared towards those companies that are at the stage of saying, we need to have a subsidiary in China. Um, and one of the first episodes I am talking about is the mindset needed to do business in China. And in that presentation, I look at vision. You have a goal when you're going into China. The original market research that you have done is going to highlight what those goals and objectives are for going into China. There's no point keeping that a secret in your HQ and not sharing that vision with the team that you're developing on the ground, with the clients that you're hoping to gain, right? As I say to my children all the time, sharing is caring. You need to have a collective vision. That collective vision cannot just remain in the HQ with a specified number of people. It needs to be shared with the team that you're developing on the ground, with the third-party providers that you're planning on working with, with um, clients, so that everybody is aware of how you're going to grow this business in China in the next five to 10 years. Why do I say you should be sharing your vision? It's because nobody knows the market better than the team that you're gonna hire, than the clients you're gonna acquire, and the third parties that are gonna be supporting your business to grow with you. And I wanna emphasize the third parties, you should be choosing them as well based on the objective that they are gonna grow with you. All right? Everybody needs to understand where is your company going to go? All right? And anytime that you change the vision, pivot the vision. That needs to be spread amongst the community so that they're on the same page and they're growing at the same time, all right? So make sure that you have this collective vision 
as you are trying to grow and scale the business. If your team members have no idea what the plan for the company is in the next five years, but they only have short-term KPIs, six months or one year KPIs, what is your expectation of it? I think they're really going to help you grow the business. They're going to help you grow for the short term, but they're not going to have that overall objective of growing the business in the long term, which means that if they're in sales, they might also not be attracted to projects that are, I don't know, two, three years in the distance because they're not earning their commissions today. And they don't know if they're going to be in the company in two, three years because you haven't shared the vision with them. Right? You want people, salespeople, BD people to think about, wow, we need to hit these targets in five years. How are we going to do that? Every single person I'm going to meet is a potential client that can actually garner that business for me in the long term. Maybe not today, but potentially in the long term. And then reason number 10 is fear. And there's a lot of fear right now going on around the geopolitical situation in China. Everybody is on their edge of their seats about the Shanghai sessions that are occurring on starting on the 16th of October. Um, people are frustrated by border controls, how expensive flight tickets are, quarantine regulations. Nobody can travel in um, um, within China. Um, there was just news released that uh, school is back since 1st of September, that school children cannot leave Shanghai during the October holiday. Otherwise they have to do two weeks of quarantine. So, I mean, there's restrictions everywhere, left, right, and center. There's fear of going into China, creating a business model and it failing faster than even it took to prepare for it. Um, I get that. I, I understand this fear. It's very clear to me. But if the data is actually showing you what the opportunities are, what is the current business model you should be having? What is the return on investments? And you've got all these figures in front of you, then it should not stop you from moving forward and hitting that green light button to do something in China. Okay? But don't do it alone. Get help. Create a network of third parties to support and have the mentality of growing your business, not just providing services, providing that added value service of the advisory and the idea of how to grow, all right? Build that ecosystem that can support you on the ground. It's going to eliminate the fear so that you can sleep at night. Okay? Don't let this fear be a... Um, a, uh, a roadblock to the actual success that you could potentially achieve in China. Now, if the research ultimately says China is a no-go, then China is a no-go, then you know, there's nothing to discuss. But if the research and the data is showing something else, then get over that fear, build this ecosystem, and, and push that green light. The top tip that I want to give you today is knowledge is power. The more that I listen to people's war stories, the more that I listen to um, local advisors, um, the more I, I hear the experiences of foreign and Chinese individuals in China, the more I learn about today's China. Um, and the more I learn about how to be more careful regarding the business. So gain a knowledge on doing business in China. Talk to as many people as possible about their experiences of doing business in China. Learn from the war stories um, and make aware of how that could impact your business, how you maybe wanna change your strategy in a slight way, etc. There is no company that's going to have the same path or journey in China. Everybody has a different story to tell. Um, but the more that you listen to them, the more you're going to understand what's going on, okay? But if you can at least follow and change your mindset around the, these 10 reasons that I hit on today, um, and, you know, trust me, I'm still at fault with many of them because uh, there's just so much to think about, right? It's, it's really clear for me, but I do have a support system to protect the business because um, I can't protect it on my own, okay? So do... Think about these 10 reasons, create that ecosystem, and learn from people that are on the ground. 
my biggest question for you today is, do you think you have what it takes to be an effective leader in China? Do you think that the HQ is ready mindset wise for operating in China? Now I have these five ingredients that I think are vital for any HQ, for any senior leader going into the Chinese market or currently in China. One is having the vision, a positive vision, okay? You are there in order to make the business grow and scale. Now, if you get a negative mindset and you just think because of the economy, the geopolitical situation, trade wars, tariffs, it, it, you're not gonna be able to grow because the data is actually telling you you're not gonna be able to grow. Okay, then the vision is a bit tricky, right? And you have to pivot. It means do you downsize versus grow, okay? But the vision has to still be there based on the scenarios that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis in China. Number two is the passion. And I know for a lot of foreigners that were in China this year in particular, the passion disappeared. The lockdowns in China, not just foreigners, but even local Chinese, they have suffered mentally, um, physically, and for many foreigners, there has been an exodus from China because they just have lost that passion. They need a break before they come back again. Many might not come back because they're worn out, burned out, if you will, but many who still believe in the vision will be coming back. And I've seen in the last th two, three months, a lot more expatriates being seconded to China um, because of the new regulations that no PU letters are required anymore. And these are new fresh blood coming in again with the passion and the excitement of being in China, even in the circumstances that we are all living in today. The third, agreement is, uh, the third ingredient is walk the talk. And this is really very key for the HQ. If you've got plans and you've put them on paper, then execute. Walk the talk, execute what you are promising, execute what you are saying. Don't just say it to say it, okay? Because all you're doing is promising things to your staff, to your third parties, and then nothing is initiated, frustration starts, and that's when chaos develops because there's a turnover of employees or providers no, want, no longer wanna work with you. If you walk the talk, you are going to move forward. Number four is communication. For me, this is key. Communication is vital. Um, there has to be a very strong communicative bridge standing between China and the operations, the HQ. Um, um, everybody, you know, there has to be this collective vision uh, that is there and you have to speak to each other. Okay, clearly, succinctly, transparently. And number five is courage, very simply. Nowadays, you need courage to go into China, for sure, right? We want to eliminate the fear and replace it by courage and say, when we're going, we're going. We've done the strategy. We've done the budget. We've had it validated. We've got this ecosystem of people supporting us. We're ready to go and we, we're going to go. So for me, these are the five points, these five ingredients that you really need to, to move forward. And as Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu said, a leader leads by example, not by force. And again, this is one of the things that I really don't enjoy is having phone calls from HQ who diminish um, and make the teams and providers in China inferior. Um, it still happens today. Uh, if you wanna be a leader in China, you lead by example. You show, you walk the talk of what you're promising and how you want to grow. So that is the end of the presentation today. I have no idea if there are questions that have popped in. Everybody's been very silent. Um, I would love to hear what your biggest takeaway was. And I'm going to give people time right now. If you've got questions, type those questions into the chat box. Um, and I will get to them when I just finish off these last slides. Um, I usually answer the questions when we're off the recording uh, to give people a little bit more privacy. So 
ask your questions. Love to know what your takeaways from today were. Um, just a little bit about how we can support you in China, how we can be part of your ecosystem. We provide a lot of services around corporate compliance, advisory, structure, um, and then we, we execute and implement those in China as well. All right, so if you've got any questions about the services, or if you're interested to learn more just simply about doing business in China or managing a business in China, you can email me at christina at woodburnglobal.com um, and I'd be happy to support you, uh, support you on that. And last but not least, so as you guys are part of the Thrive in China community, this is just to let you know what um, sessions are coming up. Uh, every Wednesday, we have our round table. Next week, we're gonna be talking about four areas that are eating away at profit margins in China. And then we're going through a whole series about employment in China, um, just because I'm seeing a trend now of, of expats coming in. I'm seeing a trend now of um, changes in the regulations. Uh, so I thought, why not touch on this for the next five, six episodes so people can understand what is happening. And I've broken it down um, so people can also come to what actually pertains to them. Um, so you've already subscribed. I'm going to send you Wednesday mornings an update about what's coming up um, and give you the link so that you can just log in. Um, but this is just an update for you to see what, what is up and coming. Um, and if you do want to watch the recording from today's session again, I'll be providing that later today once the recording gets, um, I don't know the IT word for it, but gets properly uploaded. Um, and you'll get an email from me on that. So I wanna thank everybody for joining. And like I said, there's no questions that have popped in yet, but I will wait for a couple of minutes as soon as I stop the recording. I wanna wish everyone a great, great day. Anybody who's watching us on replay, I hope you enjoyed. Have a great day. See you next Wednesday. Take care and goodbye.